Today on the show, we're going to start a three-part series on the idea of freedom. Why? Because guys, this is the worldview bros, okay? Freedom is one of the most important ideas in our life. One of the most important ideas in history. Our founding fathers fought for freedom. Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass fought for freedom. William Wallace yelled freedom. Jesus said the truth shall set you free. Freedom is such an important idea that powerful people and politicians have, do, and always will try to persuade you of one thing or another on the basis of what? Of freedom. Okay. Now, we ought to know uh, what we believe and why we believe it, especially the most important things. That's what the show is about. Now, you might say, come on, th there's no mystery here. I'm pretty sure we all know what freedom means. Well, guys, far be it from me to insult anyone, and, and, and sure, may, maybe I won't be breaking any new ground here, but I think this is more confusing than you might think. My argument is that there are at least three different meanings of freedom that are in our atmosphere, okay, and, and, and they don't play nicely with each other. These three visions of freedom, let's call them. They, they come from competing worldviews, vying for your attention and your adherence. Okay, I'll even say this. It's not a perfect correlation, and we can make several exceptions and qualifications, but the three freedoms that we'll discuss roughly match um, three current political visions in our life. Uh, the left, the right, and let's say the libertarians. So I hope you find that intriguing uh, as we talk about the different kinds of freedom. Wouldn't it be interesting if, if maybe you consider yourself a, a libertarian, but then you end up resonating more with like the type of freedom that the left values or vice versa. My objective is not to lead you to a particular political vision. And I'll tell you my political predilections. Like, I don't care. That's not the point. My objective again is that we all strive to know what we believe and why we believe it. We say this a lot in Christian circles, right? Um, if you have faith, know why you have that faith. Um, be able to give an account of, of what you believe and why you believe it. It doesn't have to be solely religious, but our worldview is obviously tied to our religion or our lack of religion as well. Okay. It's also in the Apologia. Um, Socrates says, the unexamined life is not worth living. Is freedom important to you? Yes? No? Well, I think we should know what we believe about freedom and why we believe it. It's one of the most important things in life. So here, let me first give you a little example of how there are certainly different meanings to freedom. So I'll, I'll give you three sentences. Can, can you use the word freedom in a sentence? Yes, yes, we can. <laughs> so here we go. First, Sal was in jail last week, but now he's free. He's free to drive to a restaurant and he's free to eat salad with, with gobs and gobs of ranch, as he does. Second, Sal is recovering from his alcoholism. Yesterday, he apologized to mom for all the bad things he's done. Now he feels like a free man. Third, Sal just recently inherited a million dollars from our rich uncle, and though he didn't leave me anything. Now he's free to live his lifelong dream of being a full-time Mavs maniac. <laughs> so think about it. You've definitely apprehended these ideas of freedom before. Let me say again more quickly. First, um, is freedom in the sense that you are physically free. No one is putting you in jail or harming you or forcing you into anything. You are free from the arbitrary power of others. This will be our focus today, by the way. Second, is freedom in the sense of being free to do what is right. Or, or better yet, you do what is right and this makes you free. You're free from your own faults and your sinfulness so that you are now free to be your true self. And finally, the third vision of freedom is freedom from any limits that hamper your dreams. In fact, you are not free until your dream comes true. One last time, we have freedom from others. 
We have freedom that comes from doing what is right. And finally, we have freedom as fulfillment of our dreams and goals. And our goal in this series is to go over the merits and faults of these visions of freedom. Is only one of them right? Or are they all partially right? Is it just a question of semantics? How is this going to be helpful to us anyway? I'm going to break it all down for you, so let's get into it. All right, guys. Um, listen, briefly, before we get started, it's, it's no secret that um, this is a baby channel, right? And we're doing what we can to grow. From what I understand, it, it does help us out to get those likes and, and uh, those questions and observations in the comments. But look, I, I get it that, you know, everyone and their brother now have a podcast and, and trying to make it on YouTube. And, and look, the reality, of course, is that not everyone is going to get listened to and, and viewed. Um, honestly, I feel super presumptuous and awkward to ask you for your views and for your time and for your support. But of course, I wouldn't try to make these videos if I didn't think that we bring something unique to the space, right? Obviously, you're watching and it means so much to me, guys. Thank you so much for your time. Again, I hate to presume on your time, <laughs> right? Um, but I'll presume a little bit further and and ask you that, that you share the channel w with anyone that you think might like it. Look, maybe maybe a lot of people in your acquaintance uh, wouldn't like the show at all, and that's fine. But I'm I'm wondering if if you don't have like an Uncle Charlie who who's coming for Thanksgiving, you know, Uncle Charlie who who likes all the philosophical and political and contentious questions, right? Surely this kind of stuff is in his wheelhouse, right? And I know I'm probably asking you to like set up his. YouTube app <laughs> or his Apple podcast app, right? It'll probably take you like a good hour to get him hooked up, but hook him up, y'all. I mean, he, he's probably going to enjoy this. <laughs> um, or maybe your Facebook aunt or I don't know. And anybody who you think, I, I, I would appreciate if, um, if, if you will send the show, share the show with them. And I, I won't bother you with, with a lot of this. Just every now and then, I think it's worthwhile to, to mention it. Speaking of which, guys, uh, happy Thanksgiving this week. I'm so thankful for my family and for my friends. Um, I'm thankful to God for every blessing in my life. And I wish uh, that you guys have a happy and restful Thanksgiving with your family. Now, let's go ahead and get into the show. Okay, guys. So three types of freedom. And today we're looking at the first. This is the kind of freedom that the libertarians usually like to focus on. And it's the kind of freedom that the founding of the U.S. is mostly based on. Um, it's the easiest to understand, and it's what we mostly think of when we think of freedom. Freedom from. Freedom from subjection to others, the harm from others, the dictates of others, okay? Or as the adage goes, the right to swing my fist ends where the other man's nose begins, right? It's a famous saying. And, and, and we understand this, right? It, it's, uh, it's certainly central um, in, the, in the worldview of libertarianism, and it's definitely in the American bloodstream, okay? And in the time that we have today, I want us to explore the merits of this vision of freedom. Um, it definitely takes its full shape in the founding of the U.S. in particular, and in John Locke's writings, um, you know, they, uh, John Locke certainly had a huge influence on the American founding. John Locke as representative of the Enlightenment. Not the Enlightenment as a whole, by the way, but the English Enlightenment and not the French Enlightenment. There's definitely a distinction we could talk about later. Um, so we should start with what Locke um, says about this vision of freedom. So he says in his second treatise on government, he says this, to understand political power aright and derive it from its original, we must consider what state all men are naturally in, and that is a state of perfect freedom to order their actions and dispose of their possessions and persons as they think fit within the bounds of the law of nature, 
without asking leave, or depending upon the will of any other man. A state also of equality, wherein all the power and jurisdiction is reciprocal, no one having more than another, there being nothing more evident than that creatures of the same species and rank, promiscuously born to all the same advantages of nature and the use of the same faculties, should also be equal one amongst another without subordination or subjection, unless the Lord and Master of them all should by any manifest declaration of his will set one above another and confer on him by an evident and clear appointment an undoubted right to dominion and sovereignty. Okay, so obviously there's a lot there to unpack, but I want you to notice right off the bat that Locke doesn't talk about freedom without also talking about natural law and equality, okay? They all have to go together in this vision of freedom. The, the gist of what he's saying is that men are born free to rule themselves because we observe the world and we notice that there is no race or class of men that is so far superior to, to the rest of us that it would merit them being our natural rulers. But notice, he is not treating freedom as an end in itself. Uh, no, he, he says we must be ruled, ruled by the law of nature, the natural law. But there are no naturally born kings, okay? We, we, we are born as our own rulers. From this basis, Locke goes on to explain uh, how and why governments are, are then formed. But let's be very clear. What is it that pre-exists any government? Equality, freedom, and the natural law. Okay, this is crucial. This is something that conservatives emphasize a lot, right? Your rights come from God, not from the government. And that's correct. Still, though, there are many misunderstandings about the Lockean view of freedom and equality. Some of you may have heard of Dennis Prager. He's a brilliant guy. Uh, he's a great communicator and, and a sage when it comes to common sense. But I disagree with him on some things, and especially when it comes to what he says about freedom and equality. He argues that the difference between liberals and conservatives is that for liberals, they, they uh, seek out equality, while conservatives, they're all for liberty, okay? I don't dispute that there is something to that, okay? He's making an observation that does make sense, but... Sometimes you need to dig a little deeper and not just rely on common sense. I mean, what, what does he even mean here? Um, th does he mean that there is something inherently wrong with the idea of equality? Is there something inherently toxic in it? I is it a matter of degree? Like, like too much equality is a bad thing for your country, but you have to get it just right. D do you need the right balance of freedom and equality? No. Okay. Equality and freedom, according to the teaching of the Founding Fathers, are, are inherently tied. Equality and freedom are inherently tied. They are two sides of the same coin. It's not a question of balancing them, but of understanding what those ideas mean and where they come from. As we see with Locke, man is by nature free, precisely because he is equal to all men. But equal how? Take a dog, for example. I would say that a dog is by nature a slave to his human master because the human master is greatly superior. You might say that's kind of harsh. I mean, isn't that kind of sad for the dog to say that? Is it really, though? I mean, we know how happy dogs can be, right? Um, I'll, I'll see if I, if I can find it. I, I, I recently read a, a study that says that dogs prefer to be with humans than with other dogs. Um, it it might have been like just certain breeds or, or something. I, I can't remember fully, but the the point is 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 made. Like we we, it, it doesn't sound crazy to us, right? I mean, we see it. Um, dogs are at their happiest when they're at their most servile to their human masters. I mean, am I wrong? They'll, they'll fetch newspapers and, and fetch your slipper like a million times. Um, and, and they only get happier the, the more they do that for you. And also think about this. Humans are better suited to providing the needs for dogs. Dogs love us because they won't get 
three square meals a day on their own or two square meals a day on their own. Or, I mean, of course they could, but not as easily nor as certainly, right? This is a master-slave relationship that is natural, okay? It's a natural master-slave relationship. We see that it's evidently natural because it works so well for the happiness of both the dog and for the dog owner. And look, I mean, I, I believe that, that God created us to be in charge of the lower animals, to, to, to be in charge of the world. We're stewards of the earth. We are responsible for the well-being and preservation of the other animals as well. <laughs> they are subject to our rule, okay? Um, so you can probably see where I'm going with this. The question is whether there is a natural master-slave relationship between humans. John Locke and the founders, um, of course, say, no, not at all. <laughs> but this is what John C. Calhoun later argues in the Confederate South, the bastard, right? Um, but the founders, no. Um, that was the whole point of what they were arguing. Set aside the hypocrisy of, of those who didn't live up to their own standard. We can still thank them for identifying the standard correctly. Men are by nature free because men are by nature equal. See, it, it does get confusing be, because the left does see equality in a completely different light. And it predominates a lot of what we see in our, in, in our culture. To the left, equality is not a natural uh, reality, but it's a noble pursuit in their mind. It's a noble pursuit, a pursuit of equality of conditions for all people. And just lately, of course, um, they've been trying to switch over to the word equity to drive their point even further, okay? So we're talking about a pursuit um, that shouldn't end until every person makes the same amount of money drives the same car and uses the same toothpaste. Okay. I'm just slightly exaggerating. They're, they're looking for equality of condition. This is not what the founders meant by equality. Equality simply means that no man is so far superior to another that he can justly treat him like a dog or a horse. No more, no less. That's what they meant by it. This understanding of equality is not a vague ideal. It's a very specific meaning. Jefferson uh, says it best in his kind of Virginian way. Okay, He says, The mass of mankind has not been born with saddles on their backs, nor a favored few booted and spurred ready to ride them. Exactly. And it's the same thing Locke is saying. And I can't emphasize it enough. This view of freedom... Um, that we're exploring today fundamentally rests on the premise that all men are created equal. And, and what does that mean? Not that we all have the same talents, intellect, virtues. No freaking duh, y'all. Of course that's not true. But we are equal in the sense that no one is smart enough, strong enough, and good enough to rule us without our consent. Now, uh, briefly, we need to talk about the issue of consent. See, here's the thing. If the founders are right, and no man is by nature the ruler of another, what can possibly be the basis of just rule, of just government? None other but consent. I, I mean, there's obviously a need for government. Um, you know, this is all well and good with Locke, you know, what he says about the state of nature. Oh, oh, we're born free to govern ourselves, to dispose of our possessions and bodies as we see fit under the law of nature, blah, blah, blah. No, I mean, he, he goes on to say that, of course, we do need government because we lack the, the strength to execute the, the, the natural law on our own. Um, also, we could often use help in figuring out what the, what the natural law is in the first place. I mean, yes, it, it's open to us. It's available to us by our own reason. We can figure out what is right and just, but you know, there's also human error and uh, there's wisdom in a multitude of counsel. And very importantly, we lack the goodness to apply the natural law impartially. 
So this is this is where the social contract com- comes into play. We team up so that you know so that we can try to establish a better way to rule ourselves, but we do so with consent. So a government is necessary. The human condition requires it, but no man has a natural claim to it over others. There are no natural born kings and there are no natural born subjects. From our natural state of freedom, we consent to the establishment of a government. But if it violates its end, its goal, which is to rule according to the natural law, we have the right, we have the duty to take back what is naturally ours, our freedom. Okay. Now, any, any form of government democratic, aristocratic, monarchic, any form of government can be by consent and therefore be a just government. But the founders, of course, created a mixed government, a constitutional republic. But, you know, that's another, that's another show. But the end of any just government is the same. To subject men to the rule, not of man, but to the rule of law, in particular, the natural law. The point um, is not freedom in itself. Freedom in itself is not the ultimate goal. The ultimate point is that we live well. The ultimate point is the good. The good is our aim. Freedom is secondary. It's important, but it's more of a means than it is an end. One of my favorite thinkers in the founding era is John Wise. He says something beautiful. He, He says this, Man is a freeborn subject under the crown of heaven and owes homage to none but God himself. I take this statement, by the way, to be the very core of American political principles. Isn't that interesting? You're you're freeborn, but you're a subject, right? let's, let's Let's look at that quote again. Man is a freeborn subject under the crown of heaven and owes homage to none but God himself. That's right. You're free from the authority of other men, but not free from the authority of God and God's nature. Just because there's freedom doesn't mean that there is not a law that we are obligated to follow. Okay, this is the theme that I'm going for. Freedom is based on subjection. And, and this ties uh, with what Locke uh, sends, says at the end of the passage that we read, right? Let, let's look at that again real quick. He says, a state, also, a state also of equality, wherein all the power and jurisdiction is reciprocal, no one having more than another, there being nothing more evident than that creatures of the same species and rank, promiscuously born to all the same advantages of nature and the use of of the same faculties should also be equal one amongst another without subordination or subjection, unless the Lord and master of them all should by any manifest declaration of his will set one above another and confer on him by an evident and clear appointment, an undoubted right to dominion and sovereignty. Right. He's saying, Hey, don't get me wrong. If God were to make it clear that so-and-so was born to be a king over all of y'all, then, dude, we wouldn't have any of this freedom crap going on. But it just so happens that God did not create some of us with saddles on our back and some of us booted and spurred. Um, Federalist 10, same thing. If angels were to govern men, then we'd be good, right? But, of course, angels are not around to govern us. Um, Still... It's God who rules us, not by his will revealed in the Bible. Okay, that's called special revelation. Uh, But by his will revealed in the natural law. That's called general revelation. Okay, so what is the natural law? That, of course, that'll be another show. But the point is that right and wrong are not just subjective things. They are very real things that we can figure out. Okay. By the way, there's no question, of course, that for the founding uh, fathers of the U.S., there's no question that that founding is based on a Christian worldview. Okay. It doesn't mean that the founder said that you had to be a Christian to be an American. 
No, they explicitly deny that, right? They, they say the opposite. Like anybody can be a part of this, um, of this country as long as we understand what we're signing up for, right? It's a social compact. Everybody has to consent, but everybody has to agree on, on the basic premises of, of what they're doing when they join that political union, okay? So make no mistake, the whole logic of the regime is premised on the natural law tradition, which is Judeo-Christian, though it's also Greco-Roman, okay? It's the Western tradition. It's the, the dialectic of Athens and Jerusalem, okay? I'm, I'm almost done, by the way, guys. I, um, but I, I just need to reiterate that, again, the idea of freedom that we get from the English Enlightenment, from the founding of the U.S., okay, um, is that you know, freedom is not its own end. It's, uh, this is a vision of freedom that only makes sense as a subjection to the natural law. Okay. It's a vision of freedom that is tied to natural equality of all mankind. Um, so again, it, it, it's like you, it's like a, it's kind of like a Trinity. I mean, it's like equality, freedom, natural law. It, it's all the same. They, they have to go together. So let me make um, just one quick look back at the equality question and, and then we're done. Okay. Um, I, I'm sorry. I, I have to say that the left has, has sadly perverted the meaning of equality. It, it, it's, it's now become a contentious buzzword, you know, and I'll tell you something. I, I actually consider myself to have a lot of leftist tendencies, by the way. Okay. I, um, I'll have to make a show about this sometime, like just the semantics of left and right and liberal and conservative. I mean, it's a big confusing mess at this point. It's like you always have to um, um, define some of these terms, right? But but okay, the, the left today have it completely wrong when it comes to the issue of freedom and equality, okay? E equality has become a perverse ideal. Leftists talk about how we need an equal playing field. Uh, they know how to make it appealing to us. I, I mean, yeah, of course, equal playing field. I mean, that's exactly, uh, of course, we should have an equal playing field. Nobody, nobody disagrees with that. Um, but they don't, they don't quite mean what, what you would think. Okay, to most of us, equal playing field, that just means that we have the same natural rights, no? It, it means that the law should be applied impartially. Treat everyone the same, right? That would be an equal playing field. But, but remember that for the left, inequity is the proof of an unequal playing field. Unequal wealth, unequal results are the sole evidence needed to conclude that we have an unequal and unjust playing field. I just think that that's ridiculous on its face. You just have to think about it for, for five seconds. See, it, it's a part of human nature that some people are, are more productive than others, right? Some people are more disciplined. Some people are more lazy. I mean, of, of course we know these things. We just don't say them, right? Um, some people have a, have a sense of duty, uh, some people crash and burn, okay? You know what? Some people are rich and miserable. Some people are poor and happy. Variety is the spice of life, y'all. Okay, the, the, the right understanding of equality is that we are equal in our natural rights. We are equal in our freedom to do with our lives what we want as long as we, as we respect the rights of others. You know what that means? That means that there will certainly, there will certainly then be unequal results in what our lives look like. I, I will never make more money than Jeff Bezos, obviously, okay? Because I'm not as smart and, and I'm not as hardworking. Um, you know, even a little bit of luck is kind of important when it comes to those things as well. I will never make more money than LeBron James because I'm not as naturally gifted and God bless, man. Okay. I love having people to look up to in, in different ways. Like I love admiring LeBron's talent. 
you know, even though I think like the guy's a jerk in many other ways, you know, so I, I don't envy <laughs> uh, that aspect of him, but, uh, but I, I admire his talent and, and, and I like that, that we have this inequality, right? You know what else? I love being able to help uh, other people who are in need. Okay. Again, the variety is the spice of life. I, I encourage you guys. I encourage you to question the holy sacrament of equality, which we have placed on a candle lit shrine. Yes, equality is a good thing, properly understood. Inequality is also a good thing, properly understood. It's a beautiful thing. Okay, I'm I'm done. I'll I'll, I'll end um with a, a document from the founding era. This is a quote from the Massachusetts Council of 1773. They say this, Supreme or unlimited authority can with fitness belong only to the sovereign of the universe. And that fitness is derived from the perfection of his nature. To God's infinite wisdom and infinite goodness is due both active and passive obedience. But with truth, this can be said of no authority, whatever. That's correct. <laughs> our freedom is based on a, on a happy subjection and our equality is based on a happy inequality. Well, that covers it for this first vision, guys. Uh, we're going to continue next time with the second vision of freedom which is actually very critical of this first vision. So we'll see how today's vision can hold up against that criticism. Until then, uh, guys, please uh, leave a like and, and comment any question or observation that you may have. Don't forget to share with Uncle Charlie. All right. Um, I'll see you guys. Have a happy, happy Thanksgiving.